how how did you become co-host you i did not you, make... si you, si you signed in with the account and because i came in as myself yes. it automatically made me a co-host and it gave me the the uh they it gave me a uh, a choice reclaim host or stay as co-host uh, i see so and that, i said that's how you remain as co -host. All, all of a sudden you were here i didn't have to admit you but that's yeah. because we're both that's because i came in on the account got as it. me got it Hello, Donna. If you can hear us, you're muted. She's got a computer without a microphone and a uh, ah. camera. Okay. Has to run upstairs and get another another one if she wants to talk. <laughs> we. Uh, this week, uh, the Armitages, Donna and Ken and I, used the uh, Zoom remote control capability. I'd used it once before, but this, this was a fairly long uh, session, several hours. And it was interesting to see that my personal account had no time limitations, and Donna pointed that out. You can, you can do a support session with no time limit. On a, a yeah, yeah, one grid. one to one is there. There's one to one. There's no time limit. That's nice. I still this is Donna. I want everybody to know Mike was really really helpful, and my <laughs> scanner is now installed on the Linux. Which I, believe me, there was no way I was doing it right. So it was fantastic. Yeah, Mike can come through. Yeah, he has a lot of he has a lot of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> it's put up there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, he really did. It was wonderful. <laughs> That's all I can say is I'm delighted beyond belief. It was a really good session. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart because that was a big frustration not having a scanner. But okay. <laughs> it, it, with Huey's criticism, other people's criticism too on Linux, that is one area of Linux that if out of the box Linux doesn't recognize your printer and scanner, uh, then you've got to jump through hoops to get the drivers in. Uh, typically, both HP and Brother will print, and the system will recognize the printer and it'll print. But sometimes it doesn't. Oh. And then, and then getting the scanner, which has its own set of drivers, requires using the terminal and an interactive script and uh it is convoluted so <laughs> well brother's directions were not clear that's for sure not for me <laughs> okay sean yours kane. were michael thank you sean kane's having problems hey this sean you have problems getting in you needed a password everybody else is in you got to have the password you have to have the password. I had to go back to the email and get the password. Yeah, but it didn't. It yeah, the, the, right. It didn't. The encrypted link didn't include the password for some reason. It's uh, nine. It's nine seven three two three two. Well, the password is in the email with the link here, but that was a surprise for me. All right. Right. Try again because it's working. They, they must have changed something then. I got in with the link, but of course I own the account. Okay, he's coming in now. Oh. <clears throat> you got him? I got to work today, too. There's Sean. You're muted. 
what happened with the link? I think, Stan, you might have dropped a character or two off that link. I, I didn't go to Huey's site to see. Sometimes there might be a, there might be a space on it too. Yeah, it could be a space or or something's dropped off of it. So it took uh, the it took the ID, but it needed you to type in the passcode. Let me use a different. Computer. That was a tech. That was a tech test for tonight. Yes, I failed. <laughs> So my background shows sunny skies and breezes, but uh, unfortunately, we're going to have a rainy week, which is kind of unusual for Florida, have the whole week rainy. I love it. I remember I came down from New Jersey for, a, it was almost a week for a sales meeting. We stayed at Innisbrook over near Tampa, north of Tampa. And it was just cold and rainy the entire time. I got a terrible cold. It was a one of those things that uh, Florida was a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live here kind of thing. Yeah, I came down one time on uh, a Christmas vacation, Christmas break from upstate New York. And I said, I'm going as far south as I can go to put the top down on the car. And I, as I went through Daytona, which is where I thought I'd end up, it was so cold, I continued. I ended up in Fort Lauderdale. It was warm enough there. Well, since I've been here, 87, um, we've had two really cold, cold spells. Uh, early 90s, I guess, was one of them. We actually got down to 18 degrees, and it stayed below freezing for more than 24 hours. And we had to you know, keep the uh, swimming pool pump circulating at the keep the hose bibs draining water slowly just to keep things from freezing up. And we lost our, we had beautiful hibiscus planted all around the house and all the hibiscus bushes died out completely. Well, I can remember when I first got transferred to Orlando the first time, it would have been in the seventies and we got, and there were snowflakes coming down, and everybody got all excited about it. What year was that? I'm in the 70s. I can't, let's see, I, I was transferred back to Orlando in 75. So it would have been 75, 76, maybe <laughs> 77. Hmm. Well, Stan, if you want to kick us off. Yep, I think we ought to do that. So, Welcome to the Central Florida Computer Society Tech SIG for what is it, January 15th? 25th. 25th. 25th, 2022. <clears throat> later than it's ever been. And uh, who would like to start her off? I would, so because I may not be here, I got to pack and I sure. got to be out of the house at 5 30 in the morning. So, yep. Okay. I got to get I got to get up early to do that. All right, I want to show you a couple of things. Uh and both of them were on Facebook tonight, so uh that's probably the best place to go. Um well, no, I I don't need to do that. Hang on a second here. Uh what I just do? Stop share. I don't need to do that. I mean, now I'll share here. Sound share here. I just got to go find where it is. Whoops. That's not what I want to do. And cancel. And I don't need that. Minimize. Whoops. I want to minimize this. I got a lot of things to minimize here. I hadn't thought about this in advance, and I apologize. Uh, let me go to documents. And where did I put this? Uh, I think I put it in. Too many places to put things, tech for seniors. During uh, the tech for senior program, 
this past weekend or Monday, Monday it was. This was right outside my window. That's my window right there, and there's another window in the back, in the other corner. All this is going on outside my window. All that was going on outside my window while I was doing the Tech for Senior program, and yet none of it came through my microphone. Oh, and, great. and the reason why is I use a program called CRISP. K-R-I-S-P. If you follow me on uh, Facebook, I've got links to it. It's, it's crisp, K-R-I-S-P dot I-O is the website for the software. And it's a filter. And you uh, it finds your microphone and you designate which microphone you want it to filter. And it will filter out other noise. Uh, in fact, I noticed that I did an upgrade today and I noticed they're saying that you can even have it set to your voice and it will filter out other voices. And uh, and there were some other filters uh, that they're doing with it that can learn your voice and then filter out other voices. Uh, it's basically free. Uh, however, uh, there is a pro version and I don't know if it gets you anything more except I just thought it was good enough that I went ahead and paid the $60 a year for it. In fact, today it was just, it was one year today that I had had paid for it. So it charged me a, another $60 today, but it's a, a, it's well worth it for me. It's uh, crisp.ai. I just put okay, it in that's chat. right. Yeah. Just put it Thank in you. Chat. Yeah, it was another one that I was looking at was .io that I was looking at today to do something else. So uh, yeah, thank you. But, okay, that's... Uh, uh, that was the main thing that I was going to talk about. And there was one other thing that I did. Hang on a second. Let me go and, and let's see. Where's my browser? There was something else on Facebook that I posted. I just can't remember. That. Trying to get everything ready and get all my ducks in a row for tomorrow. Uh, well, other than that, other than the fact I'm going to be in Orlando tomorrow, uh, for three days, two nights, uh, I'm going to the FETC, which is the uh, Future of Educational Technology Conference. Uh, I've been to it before in Orlando. They have it in Orlando some years, and they've had it in other places. I think next year it's, uh, I think I saw it, it's in New Orleans, I think. Uh and they didn't have it last year. They only had it uh, virtually, I think, if they even had it. I don't recall. But it's uh, mostly K through 12. But there's enough there that I think uh, I can get some value out of it for K through 12. And I applied to go as a podcaster. The fact that uh, uh, we do the Tech for Senior show, learning Chromebooks. And so I'm dealing and dealing with teaching seniors on a regular basis. So I applied as a podcaster and they accepted it. So I'm, I've got a full ticket for the whole show. I, I didn't go today, uh, but uh, I will be there and go to some sessions. I'm going to try to do some interviews and I'm going to do the learning Chromebooks and the Tech for Senior Live show from the press room there on Thursday, at least attempt to. So uh, they do have a free expo pass. If you go to FETC.org, if you're interested, you can get on the expo floor. And there's a lot of, a lot of companies showing there. Uh, Logitech is there. Zoom is going to be there. Uh, um, let's see who else. Uh, uh, Screencastify, which is an excellent uh, program to record videos and do videos. Uh, and it's, Actually, it's quite good, and there's a free version, but it puts a little watermark in the corner. You can purchase it, and it's not expensive. I can't remember what it costs, but Screencastify, uh, they're going to be there, and it's uh, uh, an excellent program to 
do recordings. Bob G, all the videos that he does are all done with Screencastify. You can do editing, you can do a recording and so on. Well, that's all I got. <clears throat> I'll put Back links you, in, the, uh, in the chat. I got the uh, FETC and I just went to the uh, Screencastify. Thank you. Yeah, I've been looking for something like that because I do want to do some videos like that and just putting PowerPoint in the background of, of Zoom didn't seem like the way to do it. I'll go next. Give me a, give me a, let me put my screen up. Whoever's in control. And? Stan, you need to give Ken a co-host. If this works. Can you see that? There you go. Okay. That's a robo rock vacuum cleaner. Uh, doggone this thing. There, but you can get a bargains now. They don't, they're expensive if you just pay the regular price, but we're not bargains. seeing your screen, Kim. You're not seeing my screen. How do I do that? What screen are you seeing? Any? I don't know. You. No, we're just seeing the, the Zoom. All, uh... When you oh. click share screen, you'll have, if you've got more than one monitor, you'll have to pick the monitor. Okay. Well, let me see if that works. Does that work? No, not you aren't sure. Down at the bottom, there's a green box that says share screen. Click it. Okay. Bottom center. The bottom of the Zoom window. That work? Yeah. Bottom of the Zoom window, green button. It says share screen. I clicked it. Yeah, there, there you go. You go. <laughs> oh, all right. Now we see you on your. your now we your see the many cam. <laughs> okay. You just see me, huh? We're seeing many cam studio lifetime. Let's see, but this, that, does this work? You may have clicked a program rather than your full screen. Now it's up on the screen. That's interesting. I don't know what it's showing. What What do you see? Uh, Minicam Studio Lifetime, 30 frames per second, 720p. Your live video, I see your mouse in your live video. Hey, well, let me try it that way then. I'm sorry. So it may be many cam that's controlling your screen settings right now. Um, you got a choice of you or your dog. <laughs> okay. Go, go ahead and stop stop the, the share get, if, yeah. unless this is what you want. Can you see the dog now? Yeah. Can you see the dog. Yep. I don't know how to make it full screen. How about that? I have no idea. What's the dog's name? Say again? What's your dog's name? Oh, his name is Ringo. Ringo? Oh. He is must a, be a star. Uh, he, he's a he. He's a uh, Shetland sheepdog. Yeah. Beautiful dog. Barky. Very barky. <laughs> We're trying to... Trying to well, well, I got two things to show you. I guess I was going to show you the robot your... vacuum system. I got two of the little levels, and they're pretty nice. Um, what you probably want to, what you, Ken, what you probably want to do is stop the share and then bring the share back in and then make sure you're, you're getting your full screen. Way at the top, there's a red button that says stop share. The top of your screen. Uh, I don't have a screen. Okay. If you don't have the menu, just move your mouse to the top and it should appear. No, nothing up there. Huh. Are you on Windows? Yeah. No, it should be there. If you move your mouse towards the top, maybe it's not showing. No, it's not showing. I, all I got is a block of six windows, and uh, that's it. Can you... Um... 
Can I'm going to turn, turn your video. Turn your video off and then close the many cam completely. Sure. And then share your screen. All right. I'll give that one a try. Let's see what okay. happens. Stop sharing. Turn many cam off. But can't. He doesn't know how to stop share. Oh, I see. Screen back. Yeah. I'm going. I'm going to do. I'm going to do it from here. There you go. Let me uh, shut this off. Okay, that's off. Okay, you're still sharing. Okay. And it just it. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. No. That's... I'm going to stop your sharing. Yeah, please. It, it... There yeah. you go. Now turn many cam off. It's off. Now okay. Try. Now, yeah. now when you when you click share screen, you're going to see like a, a screen, and you're going to see some. I think it's. Uh, let me just do it so I can see. You'll see screen one, screen two. If you have multiple screens, and then you're going to see a whole bunch of different little boxes with different programs that you may have open. You want one of the screens, so it full gives you a full screen. Okay. I don't know what. Obviously, that's, that's not mini cam. I'm just using the straight cam now, I guess. So okay. yeah, but you you don't you want to share your screen, so okay. All right. I see screen one, screen two. Okay, you you probably I don't know which one it is, but it's probably screen one. Yeah. Okay. That's this screen. Okay. Yeah. And there you go. We see we see your windows. And with yep. all your icons, and we now see a picture of your Robo Rock. All right, that's the Robo Rock. Anyhow, uh, it's I have a tri level. I got two of them, but they're they're fairly expensive. But you can get really bargains. I paid half what they cost for both of them. And the doggonest thing you ever saw. You saw Ringo. He's he sheds a lot, and uh, we have carpeting all over the place except in the kitchen and the breakfast room. And uh, so I, I bought one of these things. My wife was dead against it. I thought, I don't know, what the heck. I bought one, put it in the family room, and it picked up all the dog hair every time. And uh, it's quite a, a snappy gizmo in that uh, when, it, when it operates, you can see where it's been. This is a this is a map of my uh, center floor. Um, the uh, this is where the Christmas tree was, and that lets me block it off, so it can't go where the Christmas tree was with all the stuff underneath it. The tracks all around here is where it goes, where it's been. Okay, this circle right here was a toy the dog left there, so it went around it. This one up here is my wife's desk. And it is really crazy up there. So it gets stuck. And uh, when it gets stuck, it sends a message and said, Master, please come and release me or something like that. Um, this is all, this is a breakfast area. This is a kitchen, dining room over here. Uh, and this is a living room all over here. Uh, this is a hallway in the foyer in here. And here is a, it, what it sees when it does a thing, it actually. Um, goes through and maps everything the first time. And what, what you see here, this is a line to keep it. There's a post right here and a rug. And between the post and the rug, it gets hung up. So I drew a line so it can't go there. What you see here is where it looked down the stairs into the family room. So pretty neat gizmo from that, from that standpoint. Um, that's that's the one that does the filming room, and it. I forget where it's stored now, but right now it's there. It is right there. And when it's all done, it goes back and stores itself like they're all supposed to. If it if it uh, runs out of battery, uh, runs low on battery, it'll go back and charge itself and continue on. And uh, this is the this is the uh, family room. And uh, this is once where it got into the bathroom here, the powder room, and it mapped it, but I don't let it go in there because it, it just spends forever going back and forth in there. Um, but 
you can see this is a, the hallway leading to the stairs. This is again back behind my wife's chair with a lot of cords because her computer's right on the other side of this. Here's what looked out the window and uh, look what we're seeing. And uh, you can see the fireplace and bookcases here, television sets here. This is the uh, leads out to the garage and the uh, laundry rooms here. And I apparently left the door open because it did look in there, but it didn't go in. But every time you, you start it up, I got it start every morning at one o'clock, it starts up uh, and uh, it runs, uh, cleans up and, and uh, that's it. You just have to empty the, it's not an empty one. It doesn't empty itself because those things, I didn't see any good ratings on any of them. And I wasn't about to spend 1200 bucks on one, but I didn't. What was, what was the price? This one? Yeah. Uh, I think that the original price was like 500 and some dollars. I got it. I got this one, I think, for 300, a little over 300. I got the other one for a little little less than 300. Um, yeah. It's worth it because my wife and I are both, both folks. Nobody wants to sweep. And something else that it does, since I have carpeting, you know, you have carpeting, the nap, the nap gets down on it and it gets flat. This thing brushes the nap up every night. When you get up in the morning, you can and walk through it. You can see where you walk. It's it really does. Both of them do a wonderful job. Uh, the other one I had was this thing here, and I won't cover it. I was going to cover it because uh, it's a ham radio, and uh, I got back into amateur radio, um, sort of by the back back way in. Um, I went to renew my license and found out it had expired. And uh, rather than give it up, I had to take the test again. So I went and took the, the technic test and, and got my license back. Then they gave me funny call letters. So they have what they call, you can go back and get your call letters back. So I went and got my original call letters back. I'll cover this another time. This thing right here is, is the thing that most of us technicians would be involved in. A lot of this stuff down here. It's only got four or five knobs on it and all these buttons. And every time you turn a button on, one of the knobs will do something, mostly this one. But uh, I'll cover that another time because it, I wanna show you the pictures on the scope because this essentially, this is a three dimensions here. It's something I've never seen before, but this essentially looks across the spectrum of the RF. Uh, this is right now tuned to 14, 195, 00 megahertz. And, uh, it's a, it's a nice gizmo, and I'll cover it another time, but that's it for me, guys. Thank you. Turning the uh, vacuum, uh, you can go ahead and just stop your share. You're, you know how to do that now? Is, is, you got the red mark at the top? Yeah. I have, a, I have a question about that picture. Top share. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There we are. All the way on the left side of that radio, there was what looked like an Ethernet port. Is that what that, was that, what that was? Uh, on on a, way on the left side there is a uh, that's a a spectrum display. It covers an RF spectrum and tells me what's going on in my in your transmitter and in my receiver, and and uh, and it does it uh, over a spectrum of, of frequencies that you that you can set. So uh, the thing the radio actually it's a software defined radio. It's not a radio that we ever knew when we were kids. It doesn't have tubes, it's a, it's a computer actually. Um, one of the interesting things, I, I just did a little research on, on the strawberry pie. You can make one of those into a pretty good re a radio receiver. Not, not a lot of, of uh, definition to it, but uh, they're used uh, by amateurs um, in what they call monitoring stations. If you wanna know if you're getting it all the way out to California, you can transmit on a certain frequency. If it hears you, on that frequency, it'll put it in on the internet and go look and see if it, if it saw you and how strong your signal was. It's amateur radio has come a long way since I quit. I, I I stopped actually being a ham thirty some years ago when I moved out of Pensacola. I had a what, uh, Paul recognized. I had a cubicle quad up fifty feet and a two kW amplifier, and uh, so I had a lot of power and a and a, and a good antenna, and it. It really worked well. It was a lot of RF flying around. Um, if the fluorescent lights in the garage were off when I was on the air, 
when I transmitted, they turned on. So there was a lot of RF flying around. But it, it's a linear amplifier, so it doesn't bother televisions or, or anything like that. It may get stereo sets, because again, there's so much, the, the transistors tend to detect stuff that they're not supposed to. And, uh, but that's pretty much gone by the way by what they call a field effect transistor. Anyhow. Uh, I, I wasn't referring to the display though. I was referring to the, what looked like a, an ethernet or a phone port on the, all the way to the left of that picture on that, on the bezel on the left side of that. What is, what is, what is that? Is it something you can connect to the internet? Oh, no, that's your microphone. That's a microphone jack? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, not a standard one, obviously. Right. But uh, yeah, that's what, uh, I guess they did that because they wouldn't think computer people would know what that plug, or non-computer people would know what that plug <laughs> was, and they'd buy Yesu microphones. But uh, <laughs> I recognized it. We, yeah, okay, look at Paul. You got one. It, yep, same plug. They, same they, plug. It's a it's a it's a telephone plug. What a rat! Stupid! Yep. I've never seen anything like this. This is my portable uh, mobile radio. It's just a phone jack. It's got to be nice to it, you know. Well, yeah, yeah I don't unplug mine. It, the it, the thing is crazy because in the in the microphone, this is it right behind me. In the microphone, there's all kinds of controls in that. See the buttons down yeah. here. And uh, you got all kinds of controls in the microphone, but uh, it's a fun machine. It, it uh, I still don't know everything it will do. One of the uh, things, it's only a hundred watts. Yeah, same thing. It's only a hundred watts, but um, the receiver in it and the collection, the, there's a, a place called Truewood that, uh, that rates all the receivers of radios, I guess, uh, anyhow. Um, it's rated third because it does have some superheterodyne in it. One, one pass is superheterodyne. After that, it's what they call a software-defined radio. Everything is converted. RF is converted into digital, and everything from there on is done digitally. So it's it's a it's a nice rig. Um, I'm glad to be back in amateur radio. I got an HOR HOA to deal with, which means I can't. There'd be no 50 foot tower with a cubicle quad on top. <laughs> I, I when I put stuff like that up, I, I actually don't hook anything to it for a while because the neighbors see it and they all drop over. And I came over to tell you that your your new system is keep my machine, my washing machine's broken now. And uh, and so you know that's what's doing it. As a book up there, there's nothing connected to it. It's just standing up there. So I do that about two weeks and after that I connect to it and if their washing machine does break, they don't come and tell me. So uh, I've done that. This one, I've got a, a wire. I got a uh, tri-level house so it goes up two stories. I got a wire that comes out and goes down across the tree, makes a turn, goes across the backyard to another tree. Uh, it shouldn't work, but it works fine. And uh, I just, I talked to Brazil yesterday and Costa Rica today. Now that's not because it's a particularly good radio, but particularly that's atmospherics. And uh, it's where the bounce goes. And uh, it's, uh, the radio works from uh, 1.6 megahertz to uh, 70 megahertz. And it will transmit only on the amateur bands, but it, it's a 100 watt transmitter also. <laughs> Which makes me wish I had the 2000 watt one back. That's down in my in my garage. I'm planning on how I can split it and bring it up here. How much does something like that go for? The and the radio? Yeah, the one you just showed the picture of that. Uh, I think about eighteen hundred dollars. Okay. There um, it's there. There's another one that's made by Icom. That's pretty close to it uh, functionally. But this is clearly better and thirty three hundred dollars more money. But I, mm -hmm. I like I say, the advantage of, of a good receiver is that you can hear all kinds of people you can't talk to. So that's not necessarily a good thing. But I'll go over some more of that because some of the display functions on it are, are really unique. I mean, things that 
when I was a programmer, we had a hell of a time just getting it done. Uh, big computers just to get a half ass done. Fast Fourier transform. I don't maybe you don't know what that what it is, but it it transforms signals into digital, so we can and back and back and forth. And uh, it lets me when you transmit, I can see what's happening spectrum wise for your audio. Plus, like it, it's got an oscilloscope on it, and I'll show all that. But it it just it's unique because it does crazy things, things that when I quit thirty years ago, thirty five years ago, amateur radio. Um, it cost a lot of money to do. And it also got me, I, I bought a couple of old radios just to see what it would get about, you know, a hundred bucks for two, for two of them, and neither one of them worked. So um, now I'm troubleshooting them, one of them, and using the parts to get, get it going back. It's a transceiver, but it's probably 25 years old. And, uh, but it's a transceiver. And it's got a little more power, but um, mostly, uh, it was just kind of fun. I turned on my oscilloscope that I hadn't used in 30 some odd years. And can you believe it didn't work? <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't stop, wouldn't come on the screen. And, and then when it did, it was way too big and I couldn't move it. So I ended up buying them off eBay. But they make an oscilloscope now that's all solid state too. But um, if you read their reviews on them, they're not that good. Um, that's just all the technical stuff. I, don't, I like to troubleshoot by seeing them. The voltage, what it's doing. A lot of times it's doing something and it, it indicates one thing on one meter and another thing on the oscilloscope where you can see it. So uh, that's more time than I expected to take. But anyhow, <laughs> are really nice. And yeah, I, the, 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 the vacuum cleaners, uh, I've got a shark and it was working fine, except I got a new router and I haven't figured out how to change the password for it so i haven't used it in a long time but uh one of these days i've got to con contact them and have them talk me through to get it back on the on the uh, wi-fi system uh but uh ron brown the guy i co-host tech for seniors he's got three or i think around three or four different brands that he's got in his house he's tried and he uses in different parts of the house uh, and there's different levels uh you know i think i i robots probably the the uh, most widely sold one out there. And they've, pr they've got a whole ton of different models from very cheap to very expensive. And they've got a new one that has something, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's the poop model. And it's, it's uh, what it does, it, it does, it can figure out if there's dog poop and it will go around it. And it's guaranteed. If it doesn't go around it and it eats it up, you can get a new machine because it, I guess if, if it goes into it, it, it really screws them up. Yeah. I, and this, I, and this one is guaranteed. It, it recognizes it and will go around it. Uh, it's the only model I've heard that does that, but, uh, uh, and I can't remember the, what the acronym is P O P stands for, but it, it's, it's really a neat idea uh, that they have, but, uh, I, and then, and then uh, Bob G has a, a wise has a, a vacuum, and that was pretty cheap, and he and he loves it. So at CES this year, there were a number of new entries, including yeah. I think in the same model line, Ken, as the one you've got, but but more updated, some self some self emptying types. Yeah, and, they have uh, itself. The AI is really getting uh, amazing. They're they're putting. Uh, the cameras, and, and in addition to just feeding the internal calculations, will now broadcast and can be a Zoom camera or it can be a FaceTime camera or whatever. Uh, and you can talk to it, and it you know, and, and you can actually have a conversation with somebody. To try and, to and some of combine it with the other things. Some of them aren't using cameras; they're using lidar. Yes, that's what this one has. Both of these. Yeah. Have that's how they map the room. And I'll yep. see it. If he leaves a toy, my, uh, Ringo leaves a toy, it'll see it and it'll go around it. But you're talking about seeing poop. He leaves once in a while, he leaves one of those chews that they have, rawhide chew. You leave that and that'll hit that and jam it, stop it. Because yeah. it tries to get by it and it can't. Uh, so it doesn't see it to stop it. So it gets caught in the, in the, in the brush. And it, if that happens, it just stops and sends you a message, release me. There was a, 
uh, I don't know what company, it might've been iRobot that released one at uh, CES this year that uh, when it, I guess the transition from hardwood to, to uh, carpeting is problematic. So they've got one now that it comes up to the carpet, senses it, and then it lifts up and then continues on. So mine, doesn't lift up, but it's, mine doesn't lift up, but it senses the change. Mm -hmm. In the kitchen, there's no rugs where Pat has put down and the rest of it's tile. So it sweeps along the tile, but as soon as it, it, it hits the, the rug, it changes and, and changes how it does it. I, I was surprised. I thought it wouldn't pick it up stuff that's in the, in the, uh, in the grout, but it did. Hmm. So the kitchen gets swept a lot more now. I, every morning at one o'clock, they turn on and run. <laughs> I, I got to check my Lasix is working. I got to check and see if the water's running. Yeah, guys, I gotta get I gotta get ready for tomorrow. So uh you watch it for him. It, it, uh just wave to me as I drive to the convention center tomorrow. <laughs> Watching for you online. All right, see you later. Bye bye. I got a couple of things I can share my screen on if you like, Stan. Okay, yes, go ahead. I had a question for you, but I'll send them an email. All righty. So earlier, uh, Donna mentioned that I was helping her with a couple of problems, Donna and Ken, and we got to discussing how you could set up a bootable USB stick with more than one item on it or use of space. And I believe we've talked about Ventoy in the past, but I just wanted to sort of bring it up to date. So if you haven't heard of it before, Ventoy is a, uh, it's what's called, what we in Linux would call a live distro. In other words, you what you put, do is you put it on a USB stick or on a CD drive, but, that, but preferably a USB stick. And then all you have to do is just drag and drop any number of ISOs, files with an ISO extension onto that drive, uh, whether they're bootable Linux distributions, whether they're things like Hiram's uh, disk manager, uh, whether they're Windows utilities that are actually designed to boot, uh, anything that, that's got an ISO that boots up can be dragged and dropped physically onto Ventoy. It doesn't have to be installed just dragged and dropped. <clears throat> and then you remove it from your computer and you reboot your computer using your function keys or whatever you use to force it to boot from a USB drive. And Ventoy's little operating system, very small operating system, probably written in Linux. But anyway, it's, it's little operating system recognizes all the ISOs that are stored on the drive and gives you a menu and you just use your arrow keys and go up and down through the ISOs are there and choose what you want to boot. <clears throat> it, I find it especially useful for those that are evaluating different Linux operating systems and distributions because uh, otherwise you're basically, as, and I do have a, a box probably of I don't know, looks like about 12 USB sticks sitting over there. So this lets you consolidate them. At any rate, it's available to be downloaded um, into Windows, Mac, or Linux. So um, it does have the ability to download a Windows version. It does have the ability to download a, um, a Linux version that has been compressed, which is what we did first. And then Donna noticed, hey, there's a, a live CD ISO here. Why don't we just download that and put that on the stick? And I said, yep, that's a good idea. And that worked out very well for us. We, we, and it would work for Windows as well. All you do is you, you click on that and you got the release and you go to the live ISO and it downloads. Let's see where are we go in here because it's supposed to be clickable. Oh, it's down here. Okay. You click on the live CD and it downloads it and then you install it. 
Now, once it's installed, assuming this will come up, let me just see where it is in my alt tab arsenal here. Okay, it went away. So to the screen, get, excuse me while I look for it. Hmm, not here. Let's see if it just dragged itself behind this guy. Yeah, I see it. Okay. So when you when you boot it up, when you, when you start it initially from whatever computer you've installed it, when you start it, it comes up with this menu. And if you put a USB stick in, I don't have one in at the moment, it'll recognize the stick and it'll it'll show it to you here, tells you the version of Ventoy. And then you just tell it to, in, to install. And what it will do is it will install itself as a live distribution. So once it's, once it's installed, it's written, and this is pretty much what a Windows user would do, is they would actually run this, uh, this installation. And now your, your, your stick is ready to go as a Ventoid distribution. The other, the other method is to have the ISO right click on it if you're in Linux and just say, um, make me a, a bootable USB from it. In Windows, I think you can choose burn if it supports USB. Otherwise, you can use uh, Etcher or, uh, and it, I, I, the name escapes me, but there's another package that makes bootable USBs. So if you want to replace 10 or 12 eight gig sticks, or maybe four or five 16 gig sticks, if the intent of, of, the, of those sticks is not storage of data, but to store bootable ISOs, then Ventoy is a, is a good utility to give a try. Uh, one caution, Ventoy seems to have problems with the very latest Windows uh, computers with the latest Windows secure boot uh, settings. And I did find that out when I was testing it yesterday on my new Dell notebook which is um, last year in June. And I was finally able to get Linux on it. it. Took me a long time to get around all the secure boot stuff. <clears throat> but those BIOS are still the same BIOS even if you turn all that stuff off. And for some reason, Ventoy doesn't want to boot up on that Dell. So I'm going to say the average computer won't have a problem or perhaps the very latest ones where they've addressed those issues won't have those problems but it's something to give a try if, if you are, have a whole bunch of sticks sitting around with bootable stuff on it. Is there questions on Ventoid before I hit the next one? Okay. Um, oh, I do have this link, which I will put in chat. Uh, this is Thio Joe, who does uh, very good technical videos and uh, he does the about a nine minute video on using Ventoy, which uh, is probably he says the last Google USB you'll ever need. It's not really. I That's still, really cool. But I still use it. So you create you create this USB and then you just drag the ISO, you plug it into your computer and drag as many ISOs on there as you'd like, and then you just pick yep. from them when you boot from that USB. Yep. Wow. That's great. That's what it's supposed to do. Have you used it yet? Yes. Um, as I said, on, on the Dell, it just would not work. I've used it on the club computer. It worked just fine. Um, my, I have a, an HP desktop that used to be a Windows 7 machine and is now a Linux machine. And uh, it will not boot any bootable USB, period. I've gone into the BIOS. I've played around with it. I've, secure boot on, secure boot off, all those things. So if I actually want to boot something on the HP, I'll have to make a, a DVD or a CD in order for it to work. Just <laughs> an old machine, I guess, just doesn't want to do it. I'll close it off in that case, isn't it? I, what was the question, Ken? If you can't boot from, from a, a, anything outside 
That's the BIOS that's holding you up. And you yes, the BIOS on the HP. This is about a 2000. Well, let's see, retired 2007. I had it before then, so I'm going to say it's about a 2003 or 2004 desktop, and uh, it it just does not like to boot from USBs. So I've I've got both a Blu-ray and a DVD reader writer on it. So if I need to, I've got a stack of, of CDs around, and I'll I'll just make it make an exception. Okay, the other item that I was going to talk about is just a quick update. When we did the, uh, not so much the distros, but what's here on my column of, of playlists. When we did our main meeting, we talked, Huey and I talked about CES, and I mentioned that what I had done to organize the, the videos that, that the two of us used to talk about CES, I made playlists and then I shared them um, with by link. So in in the notes and in what Huey put on his uh, newsletter and also on his website is the link for every one of these playlists. For example, here's here's the master playlist with 72 videos of things that that I picked up at CES all the press releases, all the best of releases, the stuff on driving cars, self-driving cars, uh, Visioneer, best gear and gadgets, you name it. So there's 72 videos. That's a lot of videos to go through. So then what I did is from that list, I went through and I said, all right, how many of these address computers specifically? So contained within the master list is the sub list of Computers. So we got the best new laptops, the best of CES 2022 from Engadget, focusing on computers, uh, article from Acer, uh, incredible unfold, folding and unfolding. Um, oh, this is Asus, all right. So the incredible unfold, yeah. Uh, CyberPower, Dell, Lenovo, so on. Uh, anything that relates to chips, 14 cores, interesting. Okay, so biggest Intel's biggest move forward. Uh, digress just a moment. Today, one of the videos I was watching was a live conference that Intel was having in Ohio. And Intel has committed to build the world's largest mega factory for the native development of chips and chip technology in Ohio. And it's going to be larger than our medical city, you know, south of the 417, it's gonna be monstrous, billions of dollars being invested. And that's, I'm sure in part because of the chip shortage that's out there and the fact that we're really being held hostage uh, to the Asian countries to, to get our chips. Yep. Although we'll probably still be held hostage to get the rare materials necessary to make chips. But at any rate, by the time it's done over the next 10 years, uh, they're doing it in stages. They're gonna do a, one big mega factory and get it going with all their automation. And then they're just gonna duplicate that model and just keep upping it. They were talking about chips in the two nanometer range and they even said, and less. So we're talking you know, atomic levels of chip sizes. Anyway, chips had it. There were specific uh, press conferences so you can actually go to one of the manufacturers and see Qualcomm's live stream presentation of about an hour. If you like press conferences, Sony usually has a knock your socks off press conference, that kind of thing. So there's 26. So 26 out of the 72 videos are press. Uh, eight videos specifically on automotive. There may be more uh, or robotics. And I put the vacuum cleaners in here. So they got the dream robotic vacuum. And this is the one I was talking about, the video chats that it goes around and does. Um, a number of bloggers said best of, and it looks like I did it twice because there's best of, and then then dispatches from different, from different blog. Lawn TV did a bunch, CNET did a bunch. Uh, anybody that could get themselves a blogger pass to go in, uh, did it. 
TVs are always big. Uh, eight videos uh, from the main TVs from Sony, Samsung, LG, TCL, uh, Dell. Well, it's interesting why Dell is in TVs. I guess maybe it got miscategorized, but anyway. So um, again, this list links have not changed since what we put out. I think it's on the CF, let's see, I think Huey put it right on our website. Let me just double check. Okay, let's see if he's got it here. Special invite for members, main meeting, best of CES, yeah. Okay, so here's here's the the links that that go to each one of those that I put up. And the nice thing about using playlists, by the way, if you do plan on sharing things like I do, once you've set that playlist up, if you happen days later, weeks later, months later, if you happen to be watching a video and you say, "Oh, that's one I'd like to share," just add it to your playlist and it's automatically shared. And then as I'm doing today, you just do an update and say, hey, I put you know, another video up on the TV list or then another video. Do it with family uh, playlists too. We've got, I've got two playlists, one for each of our great granddaughters and all the videos that, uh, that they make wind up on those YouTube playlists. So that all the rest of the family has to do is just go and know they're getting the latest ones. Really cool. Back to you, Stan. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Paul's got his hand up. Yeah, you know, I got to take about a five or 10 minute break. I got a thing happening. I'll be here, but I'll, I'm just going to be on the side. So I just got a couple of things real quick. Uh, Go ahead. Don't have anything. Uh, I got an interesting piece of information. I'm going to say for last, but uh, Mike's smiling. He probably knows he can surmise what it might be. But um, you know, I've just been busy with a, a lot of stuff that's really not that tech net, computer related, and phone stuff. Uh, that's on the real top of my list. Uh, you know the. We went away for a few days to St. Augustine. I'm, I'm back. I'm got water system problems, which I've got resolved. I mean, I'm just, a, I got my farm truck, which wasn't running, which has now been resolved. I mean, I'm just going, 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 fixing this and that. But, um, actually, and uh, unfortunately, my ham radio, and we talked about my antenna analyzer that I built all these, all, these antennas with. Um, I got back from my vacation and it crapped out. So I looked at buying new ones and ones like mine and it looks like I'm sending mine back to be repaired because I can't do it. I mean, it's very involved. Um, I don't have the parts or the expertise or the, just to take it apart, you're gonna disconnect the whole front face and then you got two pieces that are not hooked up. I mean, I can't handle something like that. You need to be geared up uh, and have the tools the manufacturer has. So that's something that, I can't do, so that's kind of got me uh, in a bad mood. Um, but I can still uh, do tuning with my radio because it's got an SWR meter on and I can use that. So I'm not out of business. My ham radio stuff is working well. Um, I did have something else I can't think of right now, but the one interesting piece of information, if you guys remember about, about a year ago-ish, um, that I, I, I lost the keys to my Jeep and I made all of those videos and, uh, you know, I tore the recycle apart, the garbage, uh, the garage. I mean, I look everywhere for months. I looked at the videos, hours, I analyzed the videos. I just couldn't come up with anything. I saw me carrying the keys back into the garage and that was about it. Uh, I just assumed that I, threw the keys out in the garbage that I had gone through with these uh, 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 these putty knives that I was using the same day, you know, and I just figured I just screwed up big time. So about two weeks ago, 
I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going into my uh, bedroom uh, nightstand. You know, they usually got a couple of drawers and I'm looking for a comb. That's where I keep my spare combs. I never go to this little uh, place in the nightstand drawer for much of anything. And I keep the combs on the, all the way in the back on the left. And I went back there looking for, I needed a comb. So I went back there looking for a comb and there was the key. I almost, I almost fell off my stool, you know? So I got my key back and uh, so I'm back up and running. I did look into getting another key uh, made and I did some investigation on that. And it's a very special uh, key fob where um, you need a special, a special scanner to talk to the uh, the car electronics, the pro. That needs to use the repeater before we You know, it, it it requires real special stuff. So I kind of found out what I want to find out, but I kind of dropped the effort because um, I I just don't think it's worthwhile going forward. I'll just try to hold on to this one. Uh, maybe in the future I can find something else out, but. I'm not even sure that Jeep places can do it anymore. But anyway, I got to run for a few minutes and I'll uh, see if I can have any good thoughts when I come back. Okay. In, in relation to uh, Paul's key fob story, I'm gonna relate the, the uh, box car story. Paul, so you can go, you've heard it before. There's, yeah. very, there's a very famous Rad, Ray Bradbury or, or new Twilight Zone story. I don't remember which one, but those half hour series that used to be on TV. And, and I use this as my excuse when I can't find something and then later there it is. And the, the concept is that, a, that, that time is a series of virtual box cars, each one representing a specific amount of time. And throughout our lives, we go from box car to box car to box car. Well, there's a team or a crew with a foreman that is charged with keeping those box cars up to date with what's happening in exactly that instant of time. So the story opens up with a couple in bed and you can hear a construction crew or a moving crew. Boxes are being moved, furniture is being moved, stuff is being moved around, outside there's moving vans. There's all, you know, typical things when a moving company would come to your house. And the guys, is it that, well, what's going on? We're not, we're not moving. What, what's this crew doing here? And a guy in a, in a suit, uh, obviously a foreman, uh, walks into his bedroom, followed by two guys with like these blue man crew, blue masks, you know, covering their whole face and, and uh, overalls and coveralls and whatever. And they start to take things out of the bedroom. And the wife is hollering, leave my jewelry alone. And he's saying, leave my keys alone. And the foreman says, wait, wait, don't interrupt these people. You're not even supposed to be here. You're supposed to be in the next box car. He says, what? So he explains this concept of time and the fact that he and his crew is responsible for moving things from box car to box car to box car, but he's got terrible help, you know? And every now and then they'll miss something and it'll get left in a prior box car. And when they realize that, and they realize it because they're monitoring you and you're saying, damn, I can't find my keys. Where the hell are they? So what he's got to do is he's got to get his quality control team to go back through the box cars, find out whatever it was that is missing from the current box car, get it, bring it in and put it where it's supposed to be or where they think it's supposed to be. Remember, they got terrible proof. So if they'd done it right with Paul, it would have been right on the kitchen counter, but. In Paul's case, they stuck it in a sock drawer. So every time my wife is missing something or I'm missing something, we, we each point at each other and say, okay, it's in another box car. It'll show up. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay, Paul, you're back. Did you come up with the other item you wanted to tell us about? 
I think he's still working on something online. Oh. I see okay. Sean's eating, but maybe he can talk between mouthfuls. Okay, I got another subject. Oh, okay, we'll let you talk. Um, I'm wondering if any of you can help. Stan Levin ran into you. You talked about your, your poop scooper, you know, uh, on your, your, your vacuums. He ran into a problem at his home. He's been there for, I don't know, 45, 50 years. He did not know where his clean out por porch were for his sewer system. And he started getting an overflow with his toilets and, you know, one guy, I don't know what, Roto Rooter, somebody wanted $1,500 to, to, to reverse it, reverse it, use cameras, whatever, the, the other way to try to locate them. Finally, the uh, utility, Inc., the water company came by and using the manhole covers near his house, they were able to, to go a short distance because they won't, they won't go very far before they, they want some big bucks as well that they cleaned it out for him. And so his, his problem is finally solved. But I can't imagine not knowing where those, you know, the caps that are, uh, what, three inch diameter with a two inch, you know, square that you use a, a, a wrench to get that into. And then you can try to, uh, I, I had somebody come by you know, months ago. He had a device that he put in there. It was like a, almost a, how do I describe it? Like, like a huge balloon. He put it in there, connected a water hose to it and it sealed it up. And then it, it allowed water to go through once it was sealed. So it, it applied some back pressure and he waited until he could see activity going on in the toilet. And sure enough, once he did that, that solved my problem. It was like he had just lodged it. But when, when a house is built, doesn't the deed was filed with the, I think with the county, would that not include blueprints and, and diagrams and stuff like that? I've got a full survey online, which has the complete floor plan of my house on it. And I'm pretty sure it shows the main water line coming from the street. Uh, it shows the easement for the utilities, uh, telephone and electric. And if I'm not mistaken, it also shows the sewer drain outs on the side. I'm not, I haven't looked at it in ages, but I, I'm pretty sure it's there. I know where they are because we've had the rotor root a couple of times. But where, where is that blueprint? Where is that something that you, you have? Um, in your I'm trying to remember the survey normally just gives you the outline of the house, but this had more on it. So it could be, you know, an 11 by 14 document that I've got in my files folded in half and a half again or something. Um, and it, I, it, it piqued my curiosity. So I'll go dig it out of my dusty file cabinets. I think it's around somewhere. One of the things I did do when this house was built, I came in advance of my family to Orlando and I was stationed with the Navy at the main NTC downtown. And then we built in Stillwater, which was a brand new subdivision off of Alabama Trail, which was two lanes at the time. And it only had about 30 homes in it at the time. And once we contracted for the house to be built, I would come out usually daily if I could, unless it was bad weather. And I would just take pictures every day on 35 millimeter half frame film uh, of, of what I saw going in. I, I, had, I have pictures of the slab and all of the pipes coming up out of the slab and where they are. When the house was framed, I've got pictures of, of all the framing and where the two by fours are, the, the big heavy bulkheads are. And I got pictures of the electric, of the rough electrical wiring. So I know where all the conduits are, where they come down. So that's all in a folder. And uh, when we were doing our uh, generator and solar work, which required a number of changes to the north side of our home to put in conduit and things and go through the walls, I brought that folder out and showed it to the workmen so they could see where everything was. 
So it's, that's kind of a nice thing to have that you don't normally get if you just go in and, and buy a house. But if you didn't have all of that, isn't some of that filed with the county or, or permits? Think. Permits, you know, what the contractors plan on doing. But yeah, the architect had to do it anyhow. Yeah. I mean, he had the layers because you air conditioning, uh, uh, sewer, water, and and power. All of them have to be layered within. So the architect has to do that. And you know, the drawings exist. You just don't have them. You're you've done really well, Mike. Yeah, like a main a developer, say he's got five different models. He'll have, and they're all built the same way. So the architect will do model this and then have all those plans. Yep. In fact, we wanted to flip the layout. We wanted to, they originally had the garage on the right side, we wanted it on the left, and they had the porch on the left side, and we wanted it on the right so we could view the pond that's behind our house. And I had to go down to Zom, who is the developer downtown or in, in uh, Winter Park. And, and I had to sit down with him and his chief architect and say, all right, what's it gonna cost me guys to have you flip it and put the porch where I want it. We also wanted the roof extended over the porch. They stopped the roof right where the, the slab was for the porch. And then over the kitchen, it came back out. So there was like a, an indentation and that made no sense to me at all. I, I said, look, I, after you build a house, I'm gonna have to go get an aluminum cover for the porch. So why not extend the roof? Well, that's not in our plans, okay? Put them in your plans. Tell me what it's gonna cost me. I don't know, I paid three, $4,000 more to have that done. So back in, in uh, 87. Okay. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Sean, you uh, got anything for us today? I do. I wanted to show, or I'd like to show the uh, remote control utility that I've been using a lot lately. Uh, I may have mentioned it in the last meeting. Um, it's called DW Service. And uh, it allows you to quickly set up a remote control session um, with somebody else so they can remotely control your computer or you can control theirs. Um, I'd like to get a volunteer for somebody to remotely control my computer. Anybody interested? Yeah, I'll do it. Hang on. Hang on a second. I just want to put DW service in the chat. I'm on their website. Do I have to download their? Nope, not their at all. Just go to the website and you're hang tight. Um, I would like to share my screen. I'll let you I'll set that up for you right now. Thanks. says I need to register. Nope, you don't. Okay. Just just hang on that screen for a moment. Yep. <clears throat> Let me know when I'm ready. Uh, you are now co-host. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see a Windows desktop? Yep. Yes. Okay. I'm going to go to DW service just like Mike did. Sorry, this is a little slow. This is a, a virtual machine. <coughs> Mike, this is the screen that you see? Yes. Okay. I'm going to download this uh, agent. And I'm going to save it to the desktop, whatever. So I just downloaded this agent to the desktop. I double clicked on it and I'm running it now. <clears throat> it's going to ask me a couple questions here. On this screen, it's um, I'm just going to say run. I accept these agreements. I'm going to say run. I'm going to say next. Yes. Okay, Mike, on your screen for the login, 
I'd like you to uh, type in the username of 596-215. Oops, hang on, I've got six, not seven. 295. Um, no. 69. Oh, 215, sorry. 215-069-059-59. password is 1647. Seven. Click sign in. Okay, that's me. Well, well wait a minute. All I'm seeing is I'm seeing files and folders, text editor, log screen. watch, resources. Oh, screen. Yeah, click on screen share for screen. <clears throat> and give it a second, it'll authenticate. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting uh, the Microsoft uh, login screen, the date and time, whatever. I guess I would press spacebar. Yeah, now I, it, I've got a Sean Kane picture of you, and it's asking for your password to log in. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So it actually logged me into your root, Sean Kane, rather than your virtual Windows. Okay, I'm gonna hit can. I'm gonna hit uh, close. Okay, and it should knock me out. I would think. Let me see. Yeah, I would think so. Still have it, but we'll see here. Yeah, let's see here. So let me try going back on mine. I'm just going to close that tab and go back just to DW service. Okay, I'm back at the DWS remote control. Main thing. Yeah, it's it's uh, it wasn't what I was expecting, and that's actually not how I usually use it. Um, <clears throat> what I usually do is I install it. So let's do let's do this. I'm going to switch the screen share. Um, to how do I do this? Uh, close this out. How do I close this out? Might be better to just stop here, the over here. screen. Yeah, it's on the other. It was on my other screen. Okay, um, I'm going to share this screen instead. <clears throat> um, Firefox. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. I created a test account on this. Okay. Um, ooh, my password manager is not working. You copy and paste, I guess. <clears throat> so you can create a free account, which is what I did while before, earlier in the meeting, I did this. Um, in this case, I'm gonna create an agent. This is on the, on the DW, this is all free. And I'm gonna click on plus. So I clicked on agents, I'm clicking on plus. Uh, I don't have any groups set up, but I could set up groups or different uh, businesses or friends and family, whatever. But I'm going to call this uh, Sean's virtual windows. I'm going to confirm. Now there's my number. Uh, now I'm going to go back over here to my virtual machine. You can't see it, but I'm going to run that same program that I downloaded a minute ago that you saw. This time I'm going to install it instead of just run. <clears throat> And during the process of installing, uh, you know what, I'll, I can share this out. Share. Okay, so I'm gonna run the DW agent or to open it. And on the screen here where it asked me, I'm gonna say install. Yes. <clears throat> 
and next. Yes, I want to install it there. The act of doing this will actually save it and it'll make it so that I can remotely control this in the future. What I was trying to do before was just a one-time access. And there is a way to do that and it should work. I don't know why it didn't that time. But in this case, I'm gonna I'm gonna enter the installation code, which I created on that screen, right? When I created that agent. So I'm going to type that in here under installation code. It's 873-551-5544. Uh, four, four. And hit next. And it's done. Let's go back over to my back over to Firefox. So here it is. I'm going to refresh this. This went away now because it's now available. So this is, if I click on this, now it gives me access to that machine and the different things I can do here. I can access files and folders. So if I wanted to uh, just peruse the hard drive, um, let's go into my account. There's my account. Say I wanted to go under my desktop. I knew there was something on my desktop, uh, which is in OneDrive. No, where is it? in this one drive so on my desktop there's that dw agent i want to i want to let's say i just want to download that uh it lets me do that right from here um <clears throat> up here i could say download or i can upload a file too so now it's downloading that the agent for me and it's going to save the file wants to know where i want to save it can you see the screen where i can select the what to save yes okay so i'm just going to say i want to save that on this desktop save um, so pretty handy. I've actually transferred a uh, 16 gig file from this from one computer up to the computer that I was uh, controlling in this in this fashion. I just clicked on upload, selected the file, put it in her uh, in her documents. So um, pretty neat. I'm going to close this out up here at the top. I can just click close. Um, I can click on logs. I can look at the resources of the system. It tells me how much memory and storage space I have and so forth, how much processor I'm using. So that's pretty handy. And here's the control of the screen. And this is all done through web interface, web browser through HTTPS. Yeah, this is what Mike was I think saying. That's what I was saying. Yeah, I must have this turned off somehow for security. Oh, I know why that is, because it is a virtual machine. That's right. why that, because that just kicked me out of my uh, Microsoft remote desktop when I did that. Yep. So, <clears throat> so here it is. <clears throat> if it's a, if it was a regular Windows computer and not a virtual machine, it would have worked like this, where you can just you can just remote. And I could see if uh, if Mike did have control, I could actually see him controlling my screen. He wouldn't have had a login in that case. You can read it, you can adjust the, the size, make it bigger, easier to see, um, and manipulate things, go onto my server. So um, anyway, a free tool, dwservice.net, and uh, super easy to use. And um, like I said, now I've got a, my one computer. I, this is a test account that I created. Here's my one computer. Uh, if I go back over here in the in the waffle up in the upper left corner, there's my agents. But I can also I could share this out if I wanted to. Um, I could click this here. I could add a person to share, put their email address in. I could share just a single group. Let me go back here. I'll go to the groups, and you can see I can create a group uh, by clicking this plus and. And you can put it, I could put a description if I wanted to, but if I hit confirm, now if I go back to my agents, I can, and the three dots here, I could say edit. And then I could say, I want this, this person or this computer rather to be in the friends and family group. I confirm that. Then if I go under contacts, I could actually add, I could say, Put an email address in there and I could say what group of computers I want to share. 
and then hit confirm. Uh, I guess I guess you'd have to register. Remember, I said when I went on there, you had they wanted me to register. Yeah, so if I wanted to share out a group of computers, I could do that. I thought there was a way to do it without that, but anyway, pretty pretty handy, uh, pretty handy tool. So there you go. When I was doing the uh, Zoom remote control yesterday with with Donna and Ken. Um, I had most of the same kinds of features, um, but I did not have the options that you were showing. Um, I also could not send or receive a file. Uh, and we were having problems at their end, having them download something to install while we were connected on an older, slower computer. They were running out of resources to do it with Zoom. So I can see that would, would be good. Although Team Viewer also has the ability to, to uh, transfer files. Yeah. Um, but I did like the fact that it was being done in a Zoom session, which I was recording. So after we had finished that whole session, I just uploaded it to my YouTube channel and sent them the link and they had, so they could go back over what we had done and, and look at some of the step-by-step -step things that we had done. Yeah. Uh, does DWS allow any kind of recording of a remote control session? I, I don't, other than re recording the screen itself, I don't believe yeah. so. I would have to have Camtasia up and running at my end to do that. But there's there's nothing on the, <coughs> like if there's nothing on your side, if you're the person that wants the control, there's nothing that you have to install. It's all done through your web browser. Yes, yeah, you don't have to install any client or anything like that. The person on the other side that wants to give you control would have to download that agent and then give you the code to uh, to log in. Um, or if they were to instead of just running it, if they install it and you had created an account, you could set it up and give them the the agent code to to uh, have it permanently be in there for future uh, control. And if you share the screen of the computer, or they're sharing the screen with the computer with me, they can at any time just take the mouse or the keyboard and and, uh, and do stuff at the same time I am, can they not? Yes. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I love it. It's been very handy. Do you use it just to move files or do you use it remotely? What was the question? Have you used it just to move files around or have you used it remotely when you're out of town? I haven't used it out of town as I haven't left any. I, I discovered it just before Christmas. Um, but I have a client that's in celebration that uh, recently had a, she wanted to get a larger hard drive on her laptop, which I did. <clears throat> and then I needed to transfer a PST file, which was, it was either 16 or 18 gigabytes. It was a huge, huge file. Um, so I, instead of driving to celebration, I took the file and I uploaded it with that tool where I showed you where I click on files and I uploaded it to her computer. It took a while. Yeah. Um, this, this, uh, if the non-paid, you know, you can, you can donate and then you'll get faster speed, but the non-paid version is limited to six megabits per second. I paid because uh, I was so impressed with it. I wanted to give them some money for it. For 120 bucks, I went up to 14 uh, megabits per second. So for 16 gigs, it you know it took a couple of hours, several hours, a couple hours, I forget. Maybe in the morning, it was a morning and I think it was done by just early afternoon or, or maybe even around noon. So, but it was handy because I was able to do other stuff. Yeah, you've got just one connection. You're not running like we do on, when we do NNTP, like 25, 30 connections. No, this is just uh, just one one connection. Yeah, I see they have plans that run from three dollars a month for eight megabytes per second to fifty megabytes per second for one hundred and twenty dollars a month. So that I would assume would be a you know a, a commercial setup to pay the one twenty. Yeah, and it's all optional, right? Yeah, you can yeah do it's just three for six donations. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought, well, I could afford 120 bucks for the year. And uh, so I went ahead and did that. 
<clears throat> paid for that. So. Very nice. I also like how simple it is. Like everything is just, you know, there's no ads. It's just uh, very, very easy and straightforward. I did have to figure out, I didn't know what the agent thing was and I had to figure out, okay, I'm looking at this and it was, it was so, it was so plain. I was a little bit stumped, uh, but then I, I did figure out, oh, oh, I need to create an agent. Okay. So I, I created that agent and then I had the code and then I was, I was off and running after that. And the fact that you can create groups uh, was also very, very handy. So nice. Okay. That's it for me. I'll throw one more thing in just before we depart. Um, our microwave started humming last week. Classic magnetron failure <laughs> for those that have had it happen before. I seem to get about five to eight years out of a microwave. Um, and um, you can't you know, they change kitchen colors about every 10 years. And you can't always match the rest of your appliances. So when we started replacing appliances, we had bisque, which was all the rage back in the 80s and 90s. And very hard to get bisque, you can in some. But when we replaced our refrigerator, we wound up getting what's called non-smear or non-fingerprint stainless steel, which actually is gray. You know, they said, oh, it's stainless steel. I said, you look at it, it's gray. <laughs> but okay, so that's great. So, all right, I said, all right, I'll, 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 we got it at Appliance Direct. I'll go to Appliance Direct and I'll just get, you know, the same brand, same size, same shape, same features, approximately the same cloth. And I'll get it in, in, that, in that gray finish. They had it on their website and on Appliance Direct, it looks like you are ordering it. You're not, you're filling out a request for a quote. So I filled it all out, sent it to them. They said, we'll get back in touch with you. And they said a confirmation. It was a, you know, just an AI type confirmation. That was Saturday morning. No, that was Friday morning, about 10, 10 a.m. when I did that. Okay, and we're without a microwave now except an old one, beat up one that's in the garage that we did actually clean up and, and use temporarily. So no, no return, no nothing. I said, all right, I'm gonna call them. Well, you call them, you get you know, the, the answering machine or whatever. And it says, leave your message for sales and we'll get back to you. I said, okay, I sent a request for quote. Here's the quote number, please call me back. I'd like to purchase this over the phone and have it delivered as soon as possible, nothing. Now it's two in the afternoon, nothing. All right, who else has got these things? Lowe's, Home Depot, Best Buy, you know, they don't have them in the color I want. They've got other makes, other brands, other things, but it's not the exact same thing. I had forgotten about Southeast Steel. Southeast Steel, I remember way, but way back when buying some Maytags from them. So I went on their website and it was the same thing that Appliance Direct had. You go through, you pick your article, it says in stock, that was nice, because I don't think I've ever purchased anything from Alliance uh, Direct, that Appliance Direct that's, uh, that's been in stock, they always had the order. So it said it was in stock. Okay, I'll fill out the order form. Fill out the order form. Your quote has been generated. <laughs> same thing. Okay, so this, this was, I'm thinking it was Friday because Saturday morning at 7 a.m. I got an email back after I received the quote from a salesperson that says, call me today and we'll arrange for the sale. So I called him. He says, yeah, we got four in stock. I did the transaction over the phone. I arranged for delivery and installation because it's an over the range and I don't lift as well as I used to. And I just figured I'd have the guy do it with $150 for delivery and install and haul away. Okay, so he says, you'll be contacted tomorrow, which was Sunday. You'll be contacted tomorrow for delivery on Monday. And I said, it's Sunday. It's all right, yeah, they, they'll, they'll contact you. Okay, they didn't. 
So Monday morning, I got a whole Southeast again, could not get the same salesperson, left a message, got an email saying, we will get the information to the installer, they'll get a hold of you. Uh, they, did, they didn't get a hold of me until late Monday night. And of course, they were supposed to have installed on Monday. <clears throat> and they said they'll be there at eight o'clock in the morning, Tuesday. And he was. Now, um, I'm used to two guys coming to do a job like this. And not to denigrate my good friend, Paul, who's kind of on the short stature, but um, that's about the size of the guy that showed up. And he did, I mean, I'm gonna say he was in his late thirties, early forties. And um, there he is, you know, with a dolly and my microwave and his toolkit. And I said, where's your assistant? He says, no, I do the whole thing myself. <laughs> okay. So he takes the old one out. I mean, he must do a lot of work in the gym. And um, he looks at the holes that have, <laughs> he looks at the holes that have been drilled up. And, you know, it's an overhead cabinet with, with a base that's framed out. And then you've got holes in there for the screws that are gonna hold this thing in place. He says, this thing's Swiss cheese. How many have you had? And I said, I don't know, four or five, whatever. He says, I got to rebuild it. So he said, that's going to be another $25. I said, yeah, rebuild it, fine. But I knew if I had a cabinet guy come out here, I'd pay a hell of a lot more than $25. Yeah. So he goes, he goes out to his truck. He comes back with pre-cut lumber, which he's used for this before, obviously. And he takes his measurements, goes out on my porch, cuts these things, comes in, frames out the whole interior of the cabinet with these big, long lag type screws, putting them into the frame of the cabinet. Then he gets his template out and he drills his holes down through that framing. And he did the whole thing himself. The only thing I did was uh, pulling the thing out of the box. He asked me to hold the box. The rest of it, he all did himself. It's in, it's working. Uh, so I guess Southeast Steel is going to be my go-to appliance place, assuming I the had, supply chain works. Yeah, go ahead. When I, when I had my kitchen, I was somewhere around uh, 10 years ago or a little bit less. Um, we, I had all the cabinets and the center island done and all the cabinets. And um, he put in a new microwave. It was a guy about my size. And he was in the house for about a you know about a week, and he did the whole thing by himself. He was very Maybe it was good. The same guy. He knew. <laughs> I'm oh. I'm I think I'm having an internet problem because everybody's breaking up, and I I missed a lot of what Mike said. Yeah, you did uh, break up a little bit. Yeah, I I don't know why, um, what, what's happening. I guess I'll just tough it out. It hasn't. <clears throat> this side has been fine. I haven't. Nobody's been broken up except your yours is. I guess has been. Uh, it's got to be on your side, Paul. Did I did I talk about my spectrum problems at the last tech thing? I don't know if I did or not. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you knew I had that I had played with a T-Mobile hotspot. Yeah. Um, but Spectrum, and I think I posted on, on the TechSig, Spectrum did in fact, finally, it was a modem that had to be replaced. But even after that modem was replaced about a week ago, which I, I know was after all these other things, Spectrum went down for, I'm gonna say six hours. And I had the, uh, the cable, which I don't know if, my, if it will reach across, there's my, there's my Ethernet cable from my T-Mobile hotspot, which is sitting up on the top of my hutch. And I just reached over, turned the, the brand new modem off, because I knew it wasn't my equipment, and plugged that thing in, rebooted, rebooted my uh, router, and I used Spectrum for two, I mean, I used T-Mobile for two days until Spectrum was stable, and I knew I could go back to it. So. Did you find out why they went down? Nope, they just, at first they, uh, their technical support said, we don't have any reports in your area. I'd like you to do this, 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 and this, disconnect, unscrew the, the I said, stop. 
this is a brand new modem. It's like a week and a half old. I said, it's your end. Well, sir, we don't have a report. I'm giving you a report. And then probably about a half hour later, I've got a spectrum app on my cell phone. It said, there is an outage in your area. And then other people started reporting outages. So um, I just did it. I just did it for that uh, time that you'd. Uh, yes, that you'd... This, this is the first Good. time that they offered to reimburse me. Good. Yeah, you know, I just did a speed test on my. Uh, while Mike was just talking, I just went into speed test by Okra. You know, 111 megabits a second uh, is is what it came up to on my. Uh, uh, on my Windows 10 laptop here. I don't know why I got a, a blip and people were, I, I lost the, I lost the whole Zoom session for about 10 seconds, everybody froze, but everything seems to be back. And I got that message that said, internet unstable. I don't know. I'd go to Starlink if I thought I could get 100% coverage. And maybe one of these days I will. How fast is Starlink though, Mike? Uh, I can be 200 plus. It just depends on, you know, on the service and the number of satellites. The biggest problem is oh. right now is coverage. You know, it's, uh, let's say that at any given time over the state of Florida, you could have up to five satellites simultaneously, depending on azimuth but there will be periods of time, but maybe there's only one. And perhaps that one is, is coming up on the Northern horizon and my neighbor's house or roof is in the way and I have no coverage for 20 minutes and then it cuts back. So, you know, until it's all over the place, I'm, I'm not ready to consider that. I do have one additional thing to say. Um, Mike gave me a boatload, a boatload of, of UPS power supplies, I don't know, a month or so ago, uh, which I took home and to see what was what, you know. Uh, one of them runs off of a 12 volt battery, which it's out at my barn. I don't know what I'm gonna do with that yet. And uh, the other two, uh, the other three are uh, standard ones that, uh, you know, uh, run the computer when the power goes down. So two of them used two 12 volt batteries. And, and I basically did things to check them out for operation. And uh, they, they basically do work okay. Um, I, they basically, two of them have bad batteries and they use two batteries a piece. So you're looking at, I don't know, $50 for batteries, right? The up and they're they're pretty large in, in physical size. The other one, which is a uh, I forget the brand name. Mike knows it, but anyway, Cyber Power. Cyber Power, and he says it's got a, a sine wave output rather than a square wave, which I haven't had time to verify yet. So that one got me really interested in using because I'd like to put it on my uh, my modem and my router. So if I lose power, at least I can go on the internet with a laptop. And, and have internet. So that was my plan. So um, I have one good 12 volt battery. So the battery that came with the unit was no good. So I replaced the battery, charged it up. Well, it was charged, but I let, it, I let the unit charge it up for itself uh, overnight. And then, you know, and I knew it was working because I checked it out. So the next day I ran a test, I unplugged it and it beeped. And I had power and I had a light bulb hooked into it. Everything was running good and everything looked really good. So then the next day I said, well, I'm gonna see how long this thing can run on a 12 volt battery. And I think I had a, looked like a, like a, seven, a 60 watt light bulb or 45 watt light bulb uh, lamp connected to it. So I just, I can just sit in my room here and watch the lamp go out if it goes out, you know? So after about a half a minute, it beeps at me. And then it, it beeps again. And uh, so Mike suggested, you know, like hitting the button. I, I, there's only one button and there's, and there's no display on it. There's no much of anything, a couple of LEDs, that's it. 
And, uh, you know, I pushed to my heart's content, but I couldn't stop the beeping. Hence, I pulled up the, uh, the manual off the internet and it says it'll beep every 30 seconds when the power goes out. So that's not gonna really work for me. Aside from it driving me nuts and probably my wife and the dog, um, it's, it's not an option for usage. I can't believe the, the, that they designed something like this. So, uh, what, and I haven't, had, I've been so busy with, you know, I just got through an airplane annual and I'm still doing the tail end of uh, a lot of the paperwork and I got to get some hoses. And the annual's done, but I got like 1% of the crap left to do. So I haven't had time to really dig into this APC that I want to get going. But what my plan is if I can take it apart and find out where this little electric horn is and disable it, then it may be something I can use. So that's what I'll eventually get to. That's at the bottom of the list. Uh, if I can stop this beeping, maybe I can stop the beeping. I just add an LED. Uh, th that's like a like probably won't happen because I, I don't know where I put it just to have it flash because I'm sure it just puts a voltage ac across this little horn that probably runs on 12 volts or something like that. So, but I'm gonna see if I can kill this beeping uh, or I just can't believe <laughs> they manufacture something like this. So anyway, that's my... Uh, I, I used to I used to favor American Power Conversion APC for all my UPSs and my surgeress. And then some of the Asian brands themselves uh, started competing with APC with similar specs, especially their online systems that are, that are what you'd call smart ups. And they're always in the circuit. So even, you know, essentially uh, power comes from the wall, charges the battery, the battery is, is then running through an inverter and then feeding to your, uh, to your equipment. And it's there all the time. So I started favoring those, even though there's probably a 30% or 40% increase in price. And I was using CyberPower and I think one other brand and they would come with a, I'm, just off the top of my head, I'm going to say a three-year warranty, adult, maybe two years. And it even included the battery, which surprised me. So most of my UPSs would fail three and a half to four years. Okay, not in warranty. Battery needs to be replaced. So the very first one that failed, I called Paul and I said, hey, I can't do anything with this. Um, and as I recall, I couldn't even get the battery out. I think it had swollen in the unit, something like that. I said, if you think you can do something with it, go ahead and I'll reimburse you if you, go, if you get batteries. And so he was able to, to open it up and found that the screw, what was it? The screw was actually uh, welded sort of to the, no, the, the, the connector or something like that. You couldn't- The battery actually outgassed yeah. Near the terminal and the terminal was completely corroded up right so what we, so what actually happened and this is kind of my version of it the terminal corroded hence the uh the, the unit couldn't charge the batteries anymore because there was no connection so the batteries went bad because they were not being charged and you, you got to keep the batteries up so and the typically, batteries went dead. typically most of us i'm sure your your ups fails get on Amazon or go to the local battery store, get some new batteries, take the old ones out, put the new ones in and you're back up and operating again. But that can get expensive too. So what I decided to do with, I don't know how many I had, I probably had six plus an inverter. So uh, I just said, all right, I'm done with all these off brands. I'm gonna go with APC and I'm gonna get network grade uh, UPS units. So if you're familiar with what a commercial network rack looks like with these blade servers all lined up inside on the rack and then things horizontally in the rack as well. APC makes a form factor of a UPS. I'm looking at, at one of them now. It's a SmartUps SC450, Sam Charlie 450. 
It's, it's on all the time. There is zero delay if there's a power outage or a surge. So nothing shuts off. Even your router always stays on, your computer always stays on, your switch stays on, all the things that, that you don't want interrupted and rebooting. Even, even if a regular UPS will keep your computer going, in my experience has been, if you get a surge that like drops for say half a second and then back on and then drops again, which I've seen, your computer is gonna go off anyway and reboot and you're in the middle of doing something and you lose your data. So uh, to me, it's worth having that type of, of uh, smart ups. I think I paid 350 for it, $350 for it, which is on the high side of UPSs. And then when the last one failed that I, I gave to Paul, I just said, all right, I'm getting another one of those. And I have a second one on the floor of my computer center running my second computer and monitor and all the, the home phone and a bunch of other stuff that's here. And my entertainment center has a cyber power that is still in warranty. And I'll, I'll bet you anything when the warranty period ends, it's gonna fail also. And if that's the case, it'll be another, another uh, APC smart up support. Well, I have a similar kind of thing with my, my new car, my, my 2019 um, Kia Soul. One day last, towards the end of last week, I went out to start it in the morning and the battery was dead. I wasn't sure of any lights that I'd left on overnight or anything, couldn't find anything. So I jumped it with Linda's car, drove maybe three or four miles, did my stuff, went around and came back. Everything was fine. Next morning, same thing. It wouldn't start. So this time I took it to an O'Reilly's and they checked the battery and they said, there's a bad cell. And I was really surprised because number one, it's, it's a new to me, fancy battery. There's no caps that you can lift off and make sure that it isn't down on water. And they said, Oh no, it's a gel. New, this is new style gel. Gel cell. Can't, can't open it. And um, anyway, <laughs> I have some warranty on the car. I called the Kia and they said, uh, well, on the battery and that it's not like the drivetrain. So it's three years and 36,000 miles. So I'm just at 40,000 on the car. So I'm going to eat that myself. And it was 220 bucks for a damn battery with a three year warranty. It blew my mind. I can remember well, not that long ago, you would get a three year full replacement and then it will be prorated out to eight years, you know, certain amounts if it died at five years. Walmart used you, to have that same. Did you have to go with, Stan, did you have to go with the gel cell? What they said was if you go with a less expensive battery, it will probably snarl up your computer. <laughs> yeah, the, right. Like if you plug it in the wrong outlet, it'll snarl up your computer. Come on. I called, <clears throat> I called Costco. They had one for 160. Um, Sam's wanted 180, but neither of them will install it. And I, at that point, it was getting late, getting dark. I mean, and the battery is, I, I can't drive there and be sure I'm going to be able to start it again. They're going to have to jump me to get back. I went why back would, to the. Why wouldn't, uh, I, you know, this is just the question. Why wouldn't a standard, you know, lead acid battery work in that car it, it would but they said that they're not supposed to put them in because they, it will snarl up the computer the computer we re, re, will know that it's not the, the high-end gel battery or whatever so anyway the <clears throat> the o'reilly people do give you a 10 percent <clears throat> military discount if you were you know in the in the service at all, you get a ten percent. So it cost me two hundred bucks, and they installed it. It took them five ten minutes. He had a special tool to get the clamp down on the bottom. I, I would have had trouble doing that, I'm sure. So what's the warranty on that battery? Three years. It's and what happens if it dies? Full replacement warranty. Yes. Great. 
up you know, to three years. The last, that, that's the what last, they all do now. There's nothing. There's nothing prorated after the three years. For 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 fifteen years or more, probably twenty, I was buying all my batteries at AutoZone, and um, you know, if they start to go bad, I get prorated, and I I kind of shifted to AutoZone for a long time. Then their prices just hit the roof, and uh, about three or so years ago, I started getting the batteries at Costco. And Costco had, I started shopping it really hard. And Costco had the, the best price and the best warranty. They had a five year, no prorated, full replacement warranty. And, and interstate batteries, right? Right, interstate yeah. batteries. And, um, you know, I've already had a couple that, that went bad under the three year uh, timeline. I went down there with the batteries, no question. You know, you carry battery into AutoZone or discount auto parts. And if it's there, and if you're looking for a prorated thing, you know, they throw it on their battery checker, which has to sit there for 45 minutes. It charges it up, it puts a load on it. You know, they want to see how much the thing goes down. And this automated meter tells them that the battery is going to bad. None of that BS at Costco. You bring in the battery. Hey, this battery is no good. You know, I explained to them that, it, you know, it, it, if the unit, if the battery sits there for a couple of days, it turns slower, or won't start. I mean, you don't have to give them any store. You just bring in the battery and they give you another one. And I've done that now twice with Costco. No questions, no stories, no, no, no anything. I mean, and it's the interstate battery, which I, I felt um, I wasn't real happy that the interstate batteries were crapping out under three years. I, I should um, have a little better service out of it. But still, and, and, and the one extra plus plus on top of that whole deal is I said to the guy, I said, well, I guess my warranty starts from the initial purchase. Oh, no, it starts from today. It starts from today when you get the new battery you paid nothing for. What a deal. You can't beat that with anything. Yeah. They're good for tires, too. Yes, they are. And especially, I think uh, Paul drives a sports car, and I did, too. And uh, I bought good Firestone tires from them, and they outlasted any tire I could get on a sports car. I mean, you get 10,000 miles, you were lucky. And I was getting a lot more than that off their tires. Uh, what the difference would be, I have no idea. But just for general technical stuff, a gel cell is a lead acid battery, Stan. Yeah, is it's it just really? sealed. It's sealed. Yeah. It's well, yeah, gel cells are sealed in that, but it's a lead acid battery. It's just Edison yeah. cell, 2.2 .2 volt. Yeah. Well, I thought a gel cell was a uh, you know, like these batteries that go in these PCs, they're they're called gel cells. I, I mean, there's some kind of acid in it, but I don't know really the construction of it. The difference but, between gel cells and, and, and lead acid generally is because the gel is, it holds the plates together because batteries, they don't go bad. What they do is short out. What, what happens is you get enough crap down the bottom of the battery and it shorts the, the cell out. So, or the cell gets a high resistance, either one's the same. And uh, so they, they both do the same. Gel cells don't have a problem of leakage. Remember, you used to be back, well, you're not old as I am, I'm 80 some, but Stan probably remembers, back when we had older cars, your, your battery bucket would actually be eaten out because of the leakage on your battery. That doesn't happen with gel cells, it doesn't happen. So they don't, I use them in, in, in my scooters. My wife and I both drive the, the scooters around and uh, they're gel cells. And, they last wonderfully, but I, I keep a uh, battery keeper on my on my scooters uh, gel cell plugs right yep. into the charging port. Yep. And uh, I've had the same set of batteries, two two twelve volts in series, so it's twenty four volts. I've had the same set in the battery box now for I think going on two and a half, possibly even three years. I used it last summer to go to the Meekum auction at the convention center. And, and I was scooting around there probably for 
close to five hours, maybe even six hours all over the, the place. I never saw the needle even budge off the pull mark. Came back home, put it on the charger. The charger did go up to a little stronger setting. Came back after dinner and had already gone back into the trickle mode and was keeping it going. So, Very nice. you know, I'm wondering, I'm, I, I've taken it to Daytona to the, um, the annual turkey runs and I've gone probably 10 miles of up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down aisles. And only once had the indicator even go down to maybe half. And that's, I said, well, okay, after four or five hours of running around and it's at half, I guess I better start heading back to the parking lot and came home and charged it again. The thing was charged up probably in about four hours and then on trickle again. So I'm, I'm amazed with the proper trickle charger, how well it keeps a gel cell, you know, from going bad. Not that it won't ever fail, I'm sure it eventually will. But. I've, I've used them up on, on that scooter than mine, on the old scooters. The new ones are, have bigger cells in them and uh, I, we've never been, like you, we've never had them go down off a of full charge. Uh, you know, going around Disney, uh, you going, you're covering a mile or so, and, yep. and it has no problem. They say it will go six miles. I've never come anywhere close to that. Hey, Paul, just a question. Are you going to the ham fest? I'm sorry? Are you going to the ham fest? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. What are the dates? Uh, February 11th, 12th, 13th, something like that. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, uh, you know, I got a, a ham radio meeting before the ham fest. Uh, I should write it on my calendar, or maybe it's in my phone. But uh, uh, let me see if it's in my phone real quick here. Yeah, I used to love going around looking at all the junk on the tables and no. buying uh, stuff I didn't need. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, I just got one additional thing to kind of throw out here just real quick. Uh, and I talked to Sean about this a couple of months ago. Uh, my wife's MacBook, right? So um, the uh, mouse pad on the, on the, on the computer, uh, you know, I need to adjust the thing and she's been using a mouse with a wire. So we ended up buying her a wireless mouse, uh, a chargeable wireless mouse. So we got it, charged it up, everything's working, right? So we went uh, away for, I'm not sure how long we've had it, but you know, um, I think we only charged it once. And then a few days ago, after we got back from being away a couple of days, uh, she says the, uh, the, the screen was locked. She says I can move, I think she can move the pointer, but, but she couldn't move anything on the, on the thing. And I said, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at this thing, I'm going, She's something drawing at the damn computer, you know? And, uh, so anyway, uh, after just staring at this for a few minutes and, you know, once again, you know, the gods have talked to me and I just decided, uh, I said, for no reason, I said, shut the mouse off. So I grabbed the mouse, I turn it off and I go to the mouse pad, everything's working again. So I said, and I was reading about problems with the mouse a couple of months ago, when I bought it, I kind of read reviews on it about you know, things locking up. And I said, ah, that's what's probably happening. So I, I charged it up and we came back uh, the next day. Everything was working great. And then last night, uh, it went to sleep. Of course, it goes to, you know, goes to sleep. And they say it'll last like a month if you don't use it a lot. I don't know how much a lot is, but, you know, it, 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 it goes to sleep when you know when you don't use it and then you, it wakes up when you pick it up so um last night um something we couldn't move the mouse or something like that i think we could scroll but i couldn't move the mouse pointer and i said well it's got it's got, it's got to be the uh so i shut it off and turned it back on and everything reconnected oh, so um you know, I guess we just have to learn to recognize uh, the quirks of this thing. 
Gotcha. I mean, otherwise, it's working okay, but uh, it was really easy to install. You know, I uh, I went into the, the Bluetooth uh, part of the, the menu, the setup menu, and I erased everything that was in there because it wasn't a brand new new computer when she got it. It, it was a, a resale. But, um, you know, I erased everything like Sean suggested. Uh, and then I just turned it on and I did what the instructions said. It was really easy to set up. It only took a, a minute. So, so I think we can deal with it as long as we know what's happening now. So I think she's happy. I still need to, I still think I can fix that mouse pad. I just haven't had an opportunity to uh, get my hands on the computer again to uh, make this small adjustment for the contacts. You got to take the battery out to do that. You can't get to the screw with the battery there. And uh, so I know I've talked about this. Well, I guess when I get to it, I'll let you all know what happens. I expect good success on this. So I'm done. Okay. okay. Anybody else got anything more they would like to bring up before we close it up? Okay, if that's the case, I declare this adjourned. Stay safe. <laughs>